This is the Science Friday Book Club live stream. I'm Diana Montano. Have you ever wondered about the sounds tiny light forms or incredibly massive creatures make that maybe humans can't hear or choose not to hear? Maybe you've heard of whale songs, but what about turtle talk? Our guest today has written a whole book about the notes of nature and the old and new technology that brings us closer to understanding the non-human sounds that abound in our world. Karen Bacher is a professor, Harvard Radcliffe Institute fellow, and author who researches digital innovation and environmental governance. Her new book, The Sounds of Life, How Digital Technology is Bringing Us Closer to the Worlds of Animals and Plants, explores a mysterious realm of natural sounds, leading us through a vast, beautiful, and complex sonic world humans are just beginning to understand. And it's the Sci-Fi Book Club pick for November. We're getting to the end of our month here together, but we are so excited to talk about this book today. Dr. Bacher is also a professor at the University of British Columbia in Geography and the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability. Karen, welcome to the live stream. It's so nice to see you here. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everybody for coming out. Yeah, it is so great to see you. Um, so I described a little bit about your work, but of course I talked for about a minute or so about all the amazing things you do. I would love for you just to tell us a little bit uh, with your own words, what it is that you do and why it has sort of led you to write this book. Thanks. So my broader research project looks at the intersection between digital transformation and environmental sustainability. And I run something called the Smart Earth Project. So Smart Earth is sort of an analogy for smart cities. So just like when we essentially uh, transform the urban environment with digital tech for good and for ill, because smart cities are pretty controversial, um, I'm studying how we are wiring up the planet, how we are wiring Gaia. And as we do so, sensors and satellites and drones, um, we're moving from the Internet of Things to the Internet of Earthlings. And there are many interesting questions that you can ask. Um, the sounds of life bioacoustics is one of the breakthrough sets of discoveries that the broader Smart Earth agenda is enabling. Um, like any new technology, these um, innovations can be used as tools, useful tools or as weapons. So uh, in addition to sort of just the wonder <laughs> of all of this cool um, innovation, there's a lot of important ethical questions we can be asking. Yeah, I think um, I had mentioned this in one of my discussion questions as part of our community space. Um, a question about, uh, you had talked a little bit in your book about honeybees being sort of trained by um, US military to almost be like drug sniffing animals um, or drug sensing animals. And I thought that was really interesting. And I asked a question about um, sort of like the ethics, but we can get to that later. Um, I'm really excited to hear more about sort of some of the specific animals that you cover in your book. Um, well, so it sounds like your work mostly happens in like digital and online spaces. It's like maybe you do a lot of this or you do a lot of this as part of your work. Is that true or are you able to sort of balance that work in the real world as well? Mm -hmm. Great question. So I'm a field scientist originally. So, to, so my background, if people, very briefly, I did a, a undergrad degree in physics, believe it or not, but a, a BA at the same time as my BSc. And then I decided to do a PhD in geography because it was the only discipline that let me do the natural and social sciences, started <laughs> studying climate change in the 1990s. And my supervisor literally worked in a garage because it was not very widely accepted even in the scientific community at that time. Mm. And since then have continued to do the um, sort of applied field work. Uh, a lot of my work is on water. Some of that work is outdoors, um, mm. boots, boots on the ground, field science, where we are trying to test out um, sort of DIY makerspace, uh, ap applied technology, applied digital technology for use in environmental monitoring and stewardship, some of that in Northern Canada. So, um, yeah, that is um, very meaningful work, especially um, trying to protect important rivers like the Peace River in northern British Columbia, where mm. I'm from, traditional territory of the Treaty 8, uh, the Dene um, and um, the Dene Za. So um, 
I hope that comes through in the book a little bit. And I'd love to hear about people's experiences tonight about being out in nature listening, because as I write in the book, digital listening is a useful tool, but nothing can replace the embodied experience of being in nature, um, mm. unmediated, embodied um, listening. So you just mentioned uh, a lot of your work has to do with water and like the first three chapters in your book, as well as another chapter later on has is sort of set in either fresh water or in the seas. Did you find that you were inspired by your, your work doing um, work with like water management and um, all of that, that research? And is that kind of maybe what led you to some of the stories that you feature in the book about whales and reefs? Yeah, I mean, water is such a fascinating medium because it's the alter ego for air. We mm -hmm. all live, we all live at the bottom of an ocean of air. You and I are swimming in air right now, right? But we can't feel it. Um, we can't see it. We don't think about it, really. Um, so, and, and yet, um, just uh, when we are confronted with water, we're sort of very uh, aware of that, the, the, the fluid space of that immersive environment, um, although air, too, is actually fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I love water as the alter ego for us as terrestrial animals. So there's some very practical conservation aspects to that, but you can explore water on a sort of um, scientific and intellectual, psychological, emotional, or spiritual level. Um, and the, the engagement with water, with whales, um, with fish, with coral, with other creatures that are water-based is sometimes really enlivening and enlightening because it enables us to look with fresh eyes at things we take for granted hmm. yeah i definitely felt that way when i was reading this book there's so much that is happening it seems like in the world that either i'm aware of and are not paying attention to anymore or i'm not aware of and there's all this technology that could possibly help me be aware of it so um I want to get to some of our audience questions, but first, Karen, you had um, the, one of the best things about this book is that um, it is about sounds, and that means as you know, we're here together. Whereas with your book, we are just reading it on our own. Um, we have a chance to actually hear some sounds. So you have brought some sounds with you tonight that we uh, can uh, listen to together. And if everyone wants to get their chat ready, I think that. Um, Karen is going to give us a little quiz tonight. There's a there's a quiz. Everyone on your toes. Everyone on your toes. Here, this is the professor and me coming out. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, just one sec. Can people see the screen? They should see the cover of the book. Yes, I see it. Great. Okay, and there's no other clutter that's obstructing your view. You're all good. I no, see. Oh, it looks clutter. perfect, Karen. Excellent. Okay, so. I'd like you all to sit back, settle down, take a deep breath and listen and tell me who is making this noise. Can people hear that? All right, let us know in the chat. Who do you think is making this noise? Karen, how, how specific do you want people to get? I want people to get very specific. I'm gonna give you 30, <laughs> 30 more seconds, 30 more seconds. Put your thinking All right. hats on. All right, so the great reveal, it is a bat. Now, not all of you um, may have heard bat sounds. Um, I was recently rock climbing this past summer and there was a beautiful little bat hiding in a rock crevice and we got up really high and boy, that bat did not want us to be there. And we, we heard some of those sounds and it, you know, I didn't really know what the bat was saying, but the intent was clear, get out of my space. So lots of bats make noise, which we have known, of course, for um, centuries. The discovery of echolocation, which I talk about in the book, uh, occurred uh, nearly a century ago, but only recently, thanks to digital technology, have we been able to listen systematically to the vocalizations of bats, many of which are in the high ultrasound beyond our human range of hearing. Um, and those vocalizations are not used only to echolocate. They are actually used for many other purposes. The echolocation, of course, you might be familiar with, bats hunt on the wing, their echolocation, their biosonar is, you know, amazing, 
uh, honed by evolution to be um, more accurate than our finest medical devices. Plants have evolved to reflect certain shapes, um, sounds back at bats to make pollination easier. This beautiful interspecies communication dialogue between pollinators and plants, uh, honeybees and flowers also do this, right? Um, so I talk about this in the book, but what's amazing, I think one of the most amazing things about the, our discoveries uh, with bats is the work of Mirjam Knornschild. If you've read the bat chapter, um, I'm not spoiling it. If you haven't, spoiler alert, um, the work that Mirjam has done has revealed that uh, bats, are, at least the species she studies, greater sacrament bats, are capable of vocal learning. This is quite unusual. Not that many species that uh, we know of actually engage in vocal learning. We could only hear it thanks to this digital tech. And once we decoded it, we realized that the, the parents, the mother bats are babbling at the babies, just like human parents babble at our babies. The baby bats babble back. They, after a, a period of babblese, they learned adult bat. They learned to uh, speak with great specificity and of course, sing their songs that are a marker of territory and culture and um, framed as dialects. Um, that differ between um, family groups, all evidence of complex social behavior in bats far beyond uh, what, what we had until recently even begun to suspect. Um, I'm gonna play one more sound. And this one um, is familiar to us all. Apis mellifera. Now, I, I want you to listen to this and, tr and try to imagine what this bee is saying. That sounds like a hungry bee to me. You can Are let you us know in the chat. Angry bee? I mean, they go hand in hand sometimes, so. Mm -hmm. Hangry, a hangry, a hangry bee. <laughs> so, so one of the amazing things about honeybees is their language is acoustic. It's also vibrational. So um, as their abdomen has six degrees of freedom, other honeybees will touch their antenna to the abdomen as the bee is moving its abdomen. So their language is also um, embodied, positional, um, and they also orient uh, their movements to the position of the sun because they can see polarized light. So imagine this complexity of this language. It's acoustic, it's vibrational, it's positional. And we're only beginning to actually decode this language thanks to artificial intelligence algorithms that combine computer vision and digital bioacoustics. And some of you may have read as far as the honeybee chapter, which talks about honeybee robots, the work of Tim Landgraf in Germany, trying to encode these signals back into robots and speak back to the hive. It's a kind of interspecies uncanny valley. And I thought I'd just show you a very short video from his lab in which he's trying to get his robot to do the waggle dance, to teach uh, the honeybees where to find a new nectar source. So here the robot is doing that classic figure eight waggle dance. The length of the dance, uh, the, the angles of the dance will tell the honeybees very specific information. His lab has not been able to uh, replicate the results very, uh, you know, with great robustness. So I would say this is just, uh, you know, I don't want to over exaggerate. This is very preliminary technology. But the point is that this illustrates the, the sort of frontier that scientists are now trying to breach in which they are learning with the help of AI specific patterns and non-human vocalizations and engaging in a variety of robot mediated playback experiments to try to speak back to other creatures, which is sort of um, exciting for some, worrying for others, and as I mentioned before, raises a lot of ethical questions. So with that as a little um, snippet of sound, um, I thought that would kick us off nicely for the, the question and discussion. So I'll stop sharing. Karen, that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I'm so glad you brought the bee sounds, or I'm sorry, the well, the bee sounds as well, but the bat sounds in particular. That was one of my favorite chapters. I didn't know about bat babbling and the high amount of, like, pretty much language. I mean, it seems like, you know, some scientists might be careful to use that term, but um, language and learning that they use is just such a fascinating chapter. Were there any animals or sounds in sort of like the non-human space that you didn't get a chance to write about in this book but that you learned about and were sort of maybe it's maybe another book in the future 
Yeah, I mean, first to comment on language, because it is a, a term that triggers scientists. Uh, it is something that uh, I think uh, I'm careful about in the book. And the reason is because scientists will talk about communication and the conveyance of ecologically meaningful information via acoustic communication, but we won't use the term language because often the term language, rightly or wrongly, is reserved for humans because of the high degree of symbolic content we have in our language. And the assertion is that unless vocalizations and you know that communicate that set of communication um, patterns contains symbolic communication, you know, mm. essentially it's not language. Now you could argue, and some do, that that definition is incredibly anthropocentric. And also we yeah. tend to assume that the symbolic encoding happens a certain way. It happens um, verbally with phonemes and you know a certain kind of syntax that is amenable to a written alphabet. So some conjecture, for example, that whales communicate essentially with 3D holograms and that are like um, kind of like um, uh, hieroglyphics, like a 3D hieroglyphic. Mm. Um, and so, so perhaps we are limited uh, in a, uh, by our own human bodies and umbelt to define language in an overly narrow way, and we're missing out on seeing the other languages that are out there. And that is an open question in science. So I just wanted to set the stage for that. Um, and then, and then a species that I didn't get to discuss. Yeah, there are so many. I mean, um, so the amazing thing about all of this research is whenever you go out and you tune, um, you tune. Uh, your digital recorder to different species, what you're going to find is most of them make noise. Mm -hmm. So there's just a, re a, 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 a paper that just came out, people might have seen it in the news after I finished the book, uh, this young researcher went out and he just recorded the sounds of over 50 different turtles around the world. Well, guess what? They all make noise. But they yeah. had not been thought to be vocally active until someone just went out and started to listen. And so, mm -hmm. and so that is that is the sort of one of the messages of the book. It seems like almost everything in nature is sensitive to sound that may be universal and quite a few species are actually um, acoustically active, either at frequencies we couldn't hear or simply we didn't pay attention and that really starts to you know revolutionize some assumptions in Western science about the privileging of sight over hearing in mm -hmm. um, how we engage with the world. Yeah. Uh, this book really taught me that too is that just because other species are experiencing the world different differently doesn't mean that they're experiencing it less and that we actually might be missing out by just not having as good of hearing as some other species so um well we've got some great questions from our audience and so i'm going to start with a question from michael so michael has a question about battery and other technology other bioacoustic technology so um, Michael, we're going to turn on your microphone. You can ask your question whenever you're ready. Oh, great. Hi, Karen. I really enjoyed your book. Thank you. Um, my question is, in the book, there's mention of the need for improved battery and like uh, communications technologies for bioacoustic research in the future. I'm also wondering about microphone technologies and if those are sufficient, I guess, for anticipated needs in terms of covering both infrasound and ultrasound, or do you uh, anticipate there will be some additional um, technology changes that will make that better? Mm -hmm. Great question. So um, to give people some context for Michael, your question is a really good one. Uh, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, when people were going out and recording these sounds, you essentially had to bring a whole minivan of equipment. It was very cumbersome. Um, I'm old enough to, you know, remember like um, analog recording with like these big, you know, reels. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so then we move to digital, then we miniaturize, we automate, it becomes portable. Um, Mirjam Knornschild even talks about uh, doing her PhD and starting out with these, you know, 10 pound cases she had to lug into the jungle and now the recorders will fit in her back pocket. So the pace, as you can, you know, imagine of, of miniaturization and automation has really been game changing. Um, but yet, Michael, you're absolutely right, there are still some technological um, limitations. One of them is battery life, like we cannot put these um, digital recording devices out there uh, forever. The other thing um, that I think is, is really challenging for researchers is they still have to gather all that data 
And then they have to bring it back to the lab and then they have to start processing it with whatever sort of a natural language processing or equivalent algorithms they're using. And so and, um, in addition to um, better batteries, um, you know, or, or, you know, solar setups that help these uh, digital bioacoustics arrays sort of become um, and self-sustaining from an energy perspective. What, what also uh, we need is basically um, processing um, right on the device. Um, and, and that is computationally obviously expensive, it's energetically intensive, and, and, we're, and we're not there yet. Another issue is e-waste. We're putting all of this digital stuff into the environment, hopefully we collect it all, but it still generates a lot of e-waste. I mean, in the very long distant future, and this is one of the projects I'm working on, the advent of um, uh, biological computing may mean we have compostable um, um, sensors, and listening devices. That's cool. Yeah, there's a great book out recently by MIT. I can't remember the title where they do this thought experiment about a compostable smartphone. Like every uh, every mm. component of it would. Now this is sci-fi. This is not real. Just to be very clear with people, but but I do worry in the short term about all the e-waste we're generating as we're excitedly going around and sticking these sensors and, and tags everywhere. So long term, hopefully someone will also come up with a solution for that. That's great. Um, we talk a lot about composting in lots of different ways in Science Friday and um, digital waste composting is super interesting actually it's not mm. something I think we've talked about so I'm gonna put that in my back pocket actually fun um yeah thanks so much Michael for that question that was that was a great question um we've got a question here from one of our attendees um they write sound travels much farther in water and humans are very noisy how can we do a better job of creating a quiet underwater environment? We talk a little bit about this in your book, Karen. Yeah, great. I'm so glad someone asked about noise pollution. So, <laughs> no, so noise pollution is, of course, a huge threat to humans. We know that even the ambient levels of noise that we accept in any urban environment contribute to increased cardiovascular risk, you know, heart attack and stroke, cognitive impairment. There was just a, a really big study in Europe about how living close to a highway increases your risk of dementia, developmental delays in children. We know noise pollution is bad for us, but it's even worse for other species, many of which are exquisitely sonically attuned. And nowhere is this more true than in the oceans where sound does travel four times as fast as light. And so many, many creatures are primarily dependent on sound. They see the world through sound, to put it in the words of Chris Clark, this amazing bioacoustician at Cornell. So as we've ramped up um, industrial activities in the ocean, it is the UN ocean decade, and a lot of that means more mining extractive activity on the ocean seabed floor, um, global shipping, etc. We have been exponentially increasing marine noise pollution with um, effects that range from reproductive um, uh, sort of limitations, um, stress, uh, seismic uh, exploration, you know, there's very loud blasts can even kill um, plankton up to a mile from the blast site. So these are, wow. pretty, yeah, these are pretty significant effects. So, um, and largely unregulated. They're, they're not, of course, we don't regulate the open ocean enough um, with respect to many things like illegal fishing, but we also haven't really addressed noise pollution, but that's going to change. And I talk about some of the researchers in the book showing that even marine plants like seagrass are negatively affected by loud noise. There's this great article in Science, depressing article, a couple of years ago about how loud motorboat noise is literally scrambling the eggs of baby fish, killing the embryos before they hatch. So what does that mean we can do? Well, one thing we can do is establish quiet zones in the ocean and there are no-go zones for ships. A second thing we can do is uh, there are new sort of um, technologies for uh, shipping vessels where essentially you can make the motor very, very quiet. They're actually quite cool tech. It has to do with the shape of the hull and the propellers, but also these kind of bubble nets that absorb the sound. Um, so that technology exists and uh, some of the regulatory um, oversight agencies for ports are starting to require this, like in, in Vancouver, um, where, where I'm based. So, uh, and noise pollution regulation is coming soon to a city near you. Paris <laughs> has put in these new noise radars 
that mm. are just like speed traps, but it's acoustic. And if your vehicle is making too much noise, they take a photo of your license plate and you're going to get a big fine in the mail. So, you know, I so, think they just installed one of those in New York City in my okay. uh, neighborhood, actually. All right. so. That's interesting. I didn't know that. It's all it's all coming, folks. Um, I would <laughs> like it to be quieter, too. So that is going to be a huge change in environmental regulation in the next couple decades. And you talk about in your book how um, the UN and regulators are also trying to work with shipping. So not just saying like blanketly, like, don't go over here. There's whales. Part of what we can do with bioacoustic technology is understand better where whales might be and where they yeah. might be in danger and how boats can sort of avoid while also still yeah. doing shipping. Yeah, that, so the work of uh, Kimberly Davies, for example, at the University of New Brunswick is fantastic because she uses these underwater drones to locate right whales, highly endangered North Atlantic right whales in real time, convey the information to ship's captains, and then um, the ship's captains have to slow down or move out of the area. They also have to stop fishing, like stop lo lobster fishing in areas where the whale sound has been identified. No ship strikes of North Atlantic right whales have been recorded in Canada. Yeah, yay. Uh, since this technology was implemented in 2019, it may not be the only thing that's needed, but at least it's something. And um, they're now talking about scaling that up across the global oceans. And I want to make a bigger point for people uh, because the bioacoustics technology can be used to essentially enable mobile marine protected areas that are not static, like, but that follow the fish. And they're doing this with tuna off the coast of Australia, turtles and Hawaii, whales actually off the coast of California coast. So, it's, so you have these kind of fluid whale lanes that are moving that take precedence over shipping lanes. Um, and that's uh, a hopeful future. It's not there yet, but um, it is a future for ocean governance that um, could be remarkably protective because we know that ship strikes are one of the major causes of early mortality of whales. Well, Bruce uh, has a question about um, how we know how animals are sort of learning and remembering. Go ahead, Bruce. Yes, <clears throat> there are a number of animals that seem to have uh, limited sensory and brain capacity. And sometimes it seems like almost, you'd think of it almost none, that they can learn and remember sounds. And I'm wondering um, what you imagine, how, how you imagine they might be able to do that. Thanks, That's, it is a profound mystery. One of the things that's so amazing about science is you come up against these great mysteries, right? So one of the science um, experiments I talk about in the book was done by Heidi Apple at the University of Toledo. And she took a very simple plant, a model organism, Aridopsis taliana, commonly used in biology, and she played noises, sounds to it. This is a playback experiment, very common in animal biology, not very common with plants. But when she did it, what she found is that the plants could discern between the sounds of white noise or music or rain or the sounds of insects chewing on leaves. There were no insects, no plants were harmed in the course of carrying out this experiment, but just hearing the insects chewing on leaves caused the plants to secrete defensive chemicals, which you can actually measure. And then she did a follow-up experiment where she played two different soundtracks. One was insects that were not a predator of that plant chewing leaves the other recording was actually insects that are that plant's main predator also chewing. And guess what? The plants could tell the difference. So their sense of hearing is way more sensitive than our own. We don't know how exactly we do this. They do this, except we do know they have little cilia on their leaves that are called trichomes, just like the cilia in your ears that are allowing you to listen to me. Those cilia vibrate. There is some biomechanical reception that's occurring. And you could speculate that the plants are tuned to the specific frequency of that in insect, so subtly tuned that they would vibrate at a sort of um, a greater frequency with uh, in response to those specific sounds. And that um, biomechanical reception could cause the you know the the biochemical cascade necessarily uh you know occurring to release the stress hormones um but that's only speculation we actually don't know the answer and it's really hard for us to answer that for creatures that are not like us because they don't have neurons so we tend to associate intelligent responses the ability to absorb information from the environment and re respond with an appropriate behavior is associated with neurons we're very you know, neuron focused. 
Um, mm-hmm. And 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 so there, when confronted with this strangeness, because it is really strange, um, you know, scientists are having to come up with entirely new experimental protocols to seek to answer the why of these behaviors. Right now, we only know the sort of um, how. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, you talk a little bit in your book as well about um, fish and coral spawn and how that even there was an experiment with different um, uh, speakers in the ocean. It's just like a re- research that I found so fascinating and again, like completely changed my perspective of what it means to sense the world. Can you talk a little bit about that chapter? Yeah, so the there's a... Um... A common assumption that we tend to make that um, creatures that don't have obvious hearing organs are not sensitive to sound and that assumption is being um, sort of undermined uh, by a a growing and now large number of empirical studies on the abilities of organisms without ears to essentially hear. So that chapter tells the story about one example which is fish larva and coral larva. So um, the fish larva discoveries came first. Um, scientists would basically do work in the lab and they have these kind of mazes. Imagine an aquarium with lots of little um, arms. So it's like a maze it, and it's called a choice chamber and you can choose, you put that little fish larva in the middle and then they can choose to go down different arms. And at the end of each arm, you put a speaker and each speaker is playing different music. So it could be playing white noise or, or the control is no noise at all. Maybe it's going to be playing Metallica down another arm. Maybe it's going to be playing hip hop. Then you have um, one choice, which is the sound of a degraded reef and another one, which is the sound of a healthy reef. And guess what? Fish larvae, these microscopic creatures, will um, pick the healthy reef. Now, that's astounding enough, but you know we can kind of get it. They, if you really look at fish, they have something called an autolith that can vibrate, you know, maybe that's their equivalent of an ear. It's sort of like one of, you know, the bones in our ears. Um, But even more mysterious was the discovery that coral larvae can do exactly what fish larvae do. When Steve Simpson, the researcher responsible for doing this experiment was first uh, asked to do the experiment, he, he just basically laughed and said, no way, coral larvae, they're these really ridiculously simple organisms. They're like little blobs, and they are. They have no central nervous system. They have just, they're these little microscopic blobs surrounded by these little cilia. But if you put the coral larvae in the aquarium in the choice chamber, they too will pick the sound of the healthy reef. And even more astounding, if you give them a choice between any random healthy reef and their home reef where they were born, guess what? They'll pick their home reef. Now, coral larvae are born in these mass spawning events. I know, wow. Coral larvae are born in these mass spawning events at the, um, on the Great Barrier Reef at the full moon. We don't know why, but um, imagine like this fireworks, they all wash out to see how do they know how to settle back home. Researchers used to think it was random. You know, they're haplessly washed here and there by the waves, oceans, currents. Well, it turns out Mm-hmm. they swim back home, which is a migration sort of equivalent to the great migrations of the salmon, you know, back up into the mountain streams. So that's a great example of scientists. And the, the scientific community was astounded by Steve Simpson's work. He did very, very meticulous work in the lab and in the ocean. Um, and they're still not quite clear how coral can do this, but they do know they have cilia. Mm-hmm. And just like our ears, they're little inside out ears, actually. But um, it leads to a more general hypothesis, which is that um, the ability to sense sound is actually quite useful from an evolutionary perspective. Um, Very back in deep, you know, way back in deep time, our ancestors, before they had eyes, before they had ears, they could have sensed vibrations. And it would be a, a, a useful adaptation to be able to sense those vibrations and know if you're dealing with a predator or a, you know, or prey or a potential mate. So it may be that the ability to sense sound and or vibrations, they are slightly distinct, um, is universal in all living organisms. And we just had never thought to look for it. Yeah, it's amazing what you'll find if you ask the right questions, right? Yeah. So uh, I just want to say to people, one of the wonderful things about writing this book is all the scientists who persisted against, you know, opprobrium from many of their colleagues and simply asked what if questions, which is one of the beautiful gifts of science to say, well, what if, you know, and they, you know, by asking that they just um, open the door on so many wonderful things. Yeah. 
Um, before we get to more audience questions, um, you talk a lot about different indigenous cultures and knowledge that are found, uh, the foundation of our understanding of the world. So you talk about um, the cessationness or connection between humans and whales of the Arctic um, Inuapit, um, the Amazonian Kamayura uh, practice of dialogue with the forest, Indonesian fisher folks ability to hear a healthy reef through their oars, that's just a few of the um, uh, examples that are in your book. Can you tell us a bit about why you interweaved these discussions of those practices throughout your chapters? Yeah, um, so, um, so I, you know, in Vancouver, I live on the unceded Coast Salish territory of, you know, the Musqueam, the Squamish and the tsleil I've been fortunate to do work with Indigenous scholars uh, like the Anishinaabe lawyer John Boros and others and do um, work in um, Dene territory in northern British Columbia, um, you know, on the Peace River, which is a tributary of the Mackenzie, which is a like Canada's cold, North America's cold Amazon. You may not know the Mackenzie River, but it's a it's a remarkable river. It's only slightly smaller than the Mississippi, but flows north to the Arctic. So that that work um, gave me many lessons, and um, the book seeks to call attention to the fact that indigenous knowledge, indigenous science, has a very uh, profound, a rich, nuanced, and very place-based um, set of techniques and understandings of the sounds made in nature, which usually far outpace Western science. And um, as Robin Wall Kimmerer says, I, I love her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. I hope people have read it. If you haven't, please, please We read do. it last month. For the okay, book amazing, yeah. amazing. Perfect Great one too, yeah. Yeah, and so her, her work is illustrative of this point that there are these um, practices of deep listening, um, which reveal a lot about nature and Western science is sort of playing catch up in a lot of these contexts, like the Inupiat that you mentioned, um, by holding, by putting the wooden or the blade of the wooden or in the water and holding the end of the order, their jawbone, they can hear all these sounds and they can decode them and understand the ecological significance, right? They pati patiently taught these Western bioacousticians how to start listening. The Kayamura in the Amazon, the very dense forest, um, uh, listening is, is actually uh, far more revealing <laughs> than seeing in a very dense forest. And so they cultivate the art of listening from a young age. And, and the book also talks about some of the anthropology uh, that has really, really, really not only um, sort of exposed the science, but also the relationality of listening. And so digital listening, I, I, I sound a cautionary note because it is sort of like digitally enhanced eavesdropping. We don't ask permission, we don't ask consent, we harvest the data while assuming that these are these non-humans are not persons. Whereas from an indigenous perspective, the non-human persons who live in this place are in dialogue with humans. And that's a very different basis on which to engage in listening. And I think these are very important ethical insights and guideposts that we need as we sort of debate what to do with our newfound superpower, because it is sort of a superpower to begin thinking about um, playback experiments with non-humans and interspecies communication. And so we're desperately in need in some of these ethical guideposts. Yeah. Did you find that by writing this book and by seeking this knowledge uh, that your experience moving through the world and listening to the world was different? Yeah, I mean, I'm way more sensitive to noise pollution, <laughs> for mm -hmm. one thing. Mm -hmm. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing how much noise we tune out. Um, and uh, in the busyness of the world, you know, uh, a body held in stillness can sort of hear the sounds of nature, even a pretty busy urban environment, you'd be surprised what you you hear. Um, so yeah, I've, I've started to listen differently. I, I, the other thing is, is silence. I think um, we tend to assume that when we listen and we hear silence, that um, that space is devoid of sound, but it might be very rich with sound, but we can't hear it. So it's also this understanding that, you know, the, our, 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 the limits of our sensory capacities um, mean we need to engage all our senses um, in uh, an integrated way. So, um, listening, seeing, smelling, touching, being. 
Um, so uh, I know I know that um, some people might have read Ed Young's book, An Immense World. You know, all of these sensory capacities are so integrated in other species. And um, so I invite people to do listening in the appendix of the book. There's lots of ways you can get involved in listening, sound walks, citizen science, you know, helping scientists label sounds, and those are all great. But beyond that, there is this sense of how do we become sort of integrated, reintegrated in our sensory perceptions of the environment. Yeah, your book is great for a lot of our readers who are immensely appreciative of a robust notes section and an appendix. So um, thank you for that. I'm sure there are lots of people here who just loved getting to the end of your book and, and it wasn't the end. There was so much more to sort of explore. Um, we have another great audience question um, from Anne from Elk Ridge, Maryland. Uh, they've got a question, sort of like a hypothetical question. Go ahead, Anne, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I was wondering if um, anybody's tested to see if uh, like virus or bacteria can can hear sounds or make sounds or uh, I mean, I, I can't even begin to think how you would do that. But uh, I'm wondering if you know if anybody's tried or. Mm -hmm. I don't know of anyone that has tried with viruses. Um, with bacteria, the closest is the work that is now being done on soil acoustics or below ground acoustics. So the soil beneath our feet is, of course, rich in microbial life. And we, we have some understanding of the mycorrhizal so associations between uh, fungi and roots and nutrient transport. But um, until recently, researchers didn't uh, in, uh, incorporate acoustic signaling in, in soil science. And now they're starting to do that. So, so um, we know that plants make sound. For example, Yossi Yavel in Tel Aviv did this very nice experiment where he recorded tomato plants making ultrasound. And he recorded them in three different states, uh, a, a healthy hydrated tomato plant, a distressed and dehydrated tomato plant, and a wounded tomato plant. They kind of cut it up, you know, cut the leaves. So he then trained an artificial intelligence algorithm to listen to the tomato plants and that algorithm could easily tell healthy plant, plant needing water, injured plant. So you can, you can then extrapolate from that to ask, well, can insects, because we know they can hear in the ultrasonic, can insects hear that? Could uh, organisms that live underground hear that? Would that explain some of the interesting associations we see with the higher amounts of biodiversity clustered around plants, plant roots. Um, no one has proven this definitively, but I'm sure it's a great question. In the next five to 10 years, we're going to see lab experiments, just like the playback experiment that I described for coral larvae being done with, you know, uh, worms or even soil bacteria. I don't know what they'll find, but again, how lovely it is that the scientists are now asking these what if questions. This leads us perfectly to a question that someone had in the chat, which reads, a common thread in the book is the skepticism which many sound research projects were initially received. Um, has this attitude changed in the scientific community after so many, it can't be true, hypotheses proved to be just that? Mm -hmm. Great question. Well, of course, skepticism is useful in science, and it is good in a way that there's a high bar <laughs> for, uh, you know, mm -hmm. paradigm, sh paradigm shifting. and. And, and fights between scientists about shifting paradigms can get pretty fierce. Uh, we all know some of the history, you know, Boltzmann or Galileo or so. So in a way, I think the skepticism within limits should be welcomed. The researchers featured in the book have been, you know, uh, laughed at, sworn at, denied funding, had their lapels shaken at conferences, which is like a big deal for scientists. Um, so, so, but I think that some of that skepticism is unhealthy and it comes from a deeply anthropocentric place and Carl Safina summed it up nicely. Um, we are scientists are afraid of committing a sin uh, of projecting anthropomorphic concepts like language or consciousness uh, onto other creatures, but in trying to avoid that sin of commission they're committing a sin of omission. That is, they're refusing to even engage with the questions of whether, for example, consciousness or complex communication are evident in other species. So we have to walk a fine line. We don't want to commit the sin of commission. We don't want to just you know, project our uh, um, 
capacities onto other species, but nor do we want to avoid even asking the question of whether they possess them. And science has erred a little too much on that latter side in the past hundred years. I do think this is now changing, but as it's changing, researchers are trying to adopt a more biocentric perspective. Um, Mirjam Knornstad, who works on bats, for example, you know, uh, says, you know, in the mid 20th century, scientists wanted to know whether um, other creatures could speak human language. That's why they taught sign language to Coco and to primates. She said, I'm not interested if they can speak human language. That would be like asking, am I intelligent? Because I can, can or cannot speak dolphin. That's not meaningful. She's much more interested in what uh, bats, in her case, have to say to one another or to say to different species, rather than asking if they want to speak to us or rather than demanding that they display language or communication um, on our terms. And I think that non-anthropocentric approach is much, much healthier. Um, nonetheless, there are still a lot of red flags. And one of them I mentioned earlier is around the definition of language. There's a big debate in the scientific community about how we define it. A second debate about consciousness, a third debate about intelligence. Many bioacoustics researchers don't go there. They work on information, communication and behavior and and they advance their empirical results eventually the weight of that empirical agenda will be enough to sort of um you know um trigger some new openings in the say the more philosophical debates but we're not there yet karen thank you so much we we're just about at the end of our time here together it went by so quickly um but i want to give you a chance if is there anything uh if people haven't been convinced by this conversation to get the book yet um, is there a part of the book that you really love or that people who have read the book consistently tell you is their favorite part that you would encourage people, you, you, that you would say to encourage people to pick it up at their local bookstore or their library? Yeah, I mean, anyone picking up the book, pick your iconic species. If the bats speak to you or the turtles or the whales or the coral uh, or the elephants. Um, but for those of you, um, who want to just dip in, I would suggest that the introduction tells um, a story that uh, is something that I hope all of us will take to heart. And that is the, the story begins with a very simple observation that humans compared to our cousins on the tree of life are very poor listeners. And much of the sounds of nature, you know, the the, the beautiful ultrasonic uh, of so many species, the infrasonic of other species, elephants, whales, even the planet itself making all, all, all um, infrasonic. If it, 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 that whole notion of nature's symphony ongoing all around us and the wonder that comes from being able to open our ears and listen, um, that's all captured on the first few pages. Um, so I'd invite people to dip in um, and and then follow along with these. These are amazing stories of scientific sleuthing. Each chapter is like a mystery, <laughs> a mystery, a short yes. mystery novel. And 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 the wonder of delight of these discoveries, um, I think, is um, something I hope people will really enjoy. Yeah, I absolutely did. So. Once again, the book is The Sounds of Life, How Digital Technology is Bringing Us Closer to the Worlds of Animals and Plants. Um, it was lovely to have you here, Karen. It is such a wonderful book, and I'm so glad that we could pick it for the Sci-Fi Book Club this month. 